Professor Dave and Chegg here. With a lot of basics covered, we are now ready to start looking at all kinds of different organic molecules. In doing so, we will see the same groups of atoms and bonding patterns over and over again. These are called functional groups, and it will be important to be able to recognize these. So let's go through the different functional groups now. One example of a functional group is the hydroxyl group. A molecule with a hydroxyl group is referred to as an alcohol, and we can represent these as ROH, where R represents any alkyl, which means just some amount of hydrocarbon. Hydroxyl groups are quite polar, so alcohols tend to be polar compounds. The exception would be if the alkyl chain is exceptionally long, such that the nonpolar section would outweigh the polarity of the hydroxyl group and make the molecule relatively nonpolar overall. But whatever the case is, it is certainly true that any hydroxyl group will participate in hydrogen bonding. This has an impact on melting and boiling points, and increases the water solubility of a compound, since like dissolves like. We name these with the suffix all, like ethanol. Now let's look at ethers. Whereas an alcohol is ROH, an ether is ROR. So instead of alkyl on just one side of the oxygen atom, we have alkyl on both sides. We have replaced the hydrogen in an alcohol with more alkyl. These alkyl groups can be absolutely anything. They can be the same group or different groups. In terms of the properties of ethers, we will have to bear in mind that they are less polar than alcohols, as there is no OH group, which also means they are incapable of hydrogen bonding. Instead, there will be a dipole because of the polarity of carbon-oxygen bonds, but it will be rather weak because of the way the bond dipole vectors add together, largely canceling out and leaving a small net dipole. This is why we see the large discrepancy in the boiling points of compounds like dimethyl ether and ethanol, which have the same mass, but differing abilities to make electrostatic interactions. These are named by specifying the two alkyl groups, such as with dimethyl ether. Now let's check out the amine. This group is based on nitrogen. The simplest amine is ammonia, NH3. With five valence electrons, nitrogen will typically make three bonds and have a lone pair left over, and these bonds can lead to any combination of hydrogen and carbon atoms in order to qualify as an amine. As we replace hydrogen atoms with alkyl groups, we can get a primary amine, a secondary amine, or a tertiary amine. These are named like ethers by specifying the alkyl groups, such as with triethyl amine. Let's now check out a whole class of functional groups that contain something called a carbonyl. A carbonyl is simply a carbon atom with a double bond to an oxygen atom. The oxygen has two bonds and two lone pairs, so it's all set, but the carbon atom will need two more bonds. Depending on what sits on either side of this carbon atom, we can get a variety of different functional groups. First, let's start with the aldehyde. This involves at least one hydrogen to one side of the carbonyl. Typically, there will be alkyl on the other side, but having hydrogens on both sides will also result in an aldehyde, commonly referred to as formaldehyde. These will be named with the suffix al, like with ethanol. Next, let's look at a functional group that is extremely similar to the aldehyde. If instead of having alkyl on one side of the carbonyl, we have alkyl on both sides of the carbonyl, this will be called a ketone. As one might guess, the corresponding suffix will be on for ketone, and specifying the location of the carbonyl on the main chain. This is 4-octanone. This is cyclohexanone. Sometimes we will use a common name, like for propanone, which is also known as acetone. Next, let's take a look at the carboxylic acid. These have a COOH group, which is a hydroxyl adjacent to a carbonyl. These are similar to aldehydes in the sense that they must occur at the terminus, or end, of a carbon chain. These will use the suffix oic acid. So this is butanoic acid. This is pentanoic acid. Next, let's look at esters. These are similar to carboxylic acids, except that instead of OH next to a carbonyl, we will have OR. So rather than a hydrogen atom here, the molecule continues with more alkyl of some kind. When we name these, we will name this alkyl group first, which is bound to this ester oxygen as a substituent. Then we refer to the parent chain using the suffix O8. So here, because this group has two carbons, while the main chain has three carbons, this will be ethyl propanoate. This will be isopropyl butanoate, and so forth. 
The last carbonyl-containing functional group we will mention is the amide. This is sort of like a combination between a carbonyl and an amine, as we can see here. First, let's examine the simpler situation, where this nitrogen is bound to two hydrogen atoms. In this case, we will simply use the suffix amide after indicating the number of carbons in the main chain. So we would get ethanamide, propanamide, butanamide, and so forth. Now, if we replace these hydrogen atoms with alkyl groups, we will have to list those as well. We specify that we are referring to alkyl groups on the nitrogen atom by preceding them with a capital N. For example, this is N-methylpropanamide. Again, the N specifies that the methyl group is attached to the nitrogen atom and not to the main chain. If it were on the main chain, we would refer to it just as we would for an aldehyde or carboxylic acid, with something like 2-methylpropanamide. We can also have two alkyl groups attached to this nitrogen. If they are the same substituent, we can list them simultaneously. So this would be N-N-dimethylpropanamide. We need both ends to make it clear that both methyls are bound to this nitrogen atom. If they are not the same substituent, we will have to list them in alphabetical order. So this would be N-ethyl-N-methylpropanamide. Now let's take a look at acid halides. These are similar to carboxylic acids, but the OH has been replaced by a halogen, hence acid halide. These will also be named similarly to carboxylic acids, but instead of the suffix ic, we will use eel, and then finish things off with the name of the halide instead of the word acid. So this would be propanoyl bromide. This would be 2-methylbutanoyl chloride. Next we can look at acid anhydrides. These are functional groups in which there are two carbonyls with an oxygen atom between them, and alkyl on either side. Here we can simply name the two alkyl groups, list them in alphabetical order, and then finish with the word anhydride. So this would be ethanoic propanoic anhydride. This would be butanoic ethanoic anhydride, and so forth. Next, we can look at nitriles. These involve a carbon atom and nitrogen atom with a triple bond between them. Because it requires three bonds from a carbon atom, these are always terminal functional groups, meaning at the end of a chain, so the parent chain will be the longest chain containing the nitrile carbon. Then we number so as to give the nitrile carbon occurring on carbon 1, and add nitrile to the end of the molecule. So this would be pentane nitrile. Let's finish off with a few more rapid fire. Alkenes and alkynes have at least one carbon-carbon double bond and one carbon-carbon triple bond, respectively. Arenes have an aromatic ring, such as benzene, which we will clarify as a concept later. Halides have a halogen atom. Thiols are the sulfur analog of hydroxyls, SH instead of OH. Sulfides are the sulfur analog of ethers, RSR instead of ROR. Thioesters are the sulfur analog of esters, with SR instead of OR. There are many other functional groups, but this will suffice as an introduction. We will see these and other functional groups many times as we learn organic chemistry, but for now, just try and become as familiar with these basic ones as possible, as they are truly ubiquitous. Professor Dave for Chegg, see you next time.